All right, you're listening to 91.5 WUML Lowell, Blues Deluxe, and it's my honor and pleasure to have the great Scott Ainsley on with me today. How are you, Scott? John, I'm fine, and I'm only as great as the last gig I played, which was some time ago, but I'm happy to be with you. Oh, you got another gig coming, I saw, soon. (laughs) You're going to be playing at Sunapee. I am. There's a coffee house in Sunapee that I played a couple of years back and very informal, uh, really lovely space, bunch of volunteers who run it. And and then I'm doing, I'm going down into Massachusetts to do a, a, a private house concert and a, and a vocal workshop, actually. When's that? It's the next day. It's the 29th, I think, of October. Uh, the 28th is the Sunapee, which is a public, public thing. The information's on the Cattail Music website. Yeah, I want to ask you about cattail music. I didn't know much about that other than that's your music site, right? Your yeah, uh, you, label. You, get, you 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 had to have a label when uh, if you put out your own record. And I, I had a record deal for about a year and a half that I was working on, and they fired the woman who I was working with, who was the president of the company, and with her went my contract into the trash and ten months of negotiation. So rather than um, start that process over again for my first record, Jealous of the Moon. I decided that for, you know, for a couple thousand bucks, I could have a thousand copies in my basement and I should do that. Do you still have them? <laughs> uh, well, no, I've sold those several times over, but I do still have CDs in the basement That's and I'll probably die with them there. Uh, nobody, nobody buys the, the uh, music anymore, but you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a new world and we're trying to figure out how to survive in it. And you bring them with you. I take it when you go to gigs, when you have gigs. Yeah, people buy them as much as a gift and a souvenir as they do for the music because now everybody listens online. And when they took CD players out of cars, they cut our throats. Yeah. So that's just the way it goes. You know, we we can't control that. The people who have distributed the music have always made all the money anyway. So uh, when artists work, they know they've got us by the short hairs because we're going to do it because we love it. And because it makes the world a, a, a slightly better place, hopefully. And, and you've been and, doing it a long time. Well, I started playing music when I was three. My mother found me at the family piano and I took piano lessons until I was six or seven and then ran into the old lady with a ruler who'd hit you on the hand, you know, and I, that woman's taught all over the world. I mean, I've run into people in Germany who've been struck by rulers uh, trying to learn to play piano. <laughs> and I gave up piano, but played everything I get my hands on. Um, and then when I was 15, I heard John Jackson, a great Piedmont blues player and songster out of Northern Virginia play. Uh, three songs in a Mike Seeger concert. And I, in 1967, I was 15. And I, I walked in there curious about folk music, being a, you know involved in music all my life. And, and I walked out a guitar player had never picked it up. Um, John played the most amazing things on the guitar. And I thought, boy, if you can do that, I'd sign me up. You know, So I started playing a month later. That's great. And um, your first record came out in what, around the 90s, right? 90s, in 95. 95, yeah. right. And then that was the Jealous record, correct? Yep, Jealous of the Moon, the first song I wrote that I that I kept. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we write. You have to practice a lot, uh, and and so uh, it's good to write a lot of songs and keep the best ones and let the other ones go. I figure it's a learning curve. So, well, you, thank thank you for sending me all the music. It's great. I've been listening to all your records, and there's a lot of great stuff on there, and there's a lot of stories in some of those songs that you have on those records. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Uh, Terraplane. Let's talk about the second record because that's where I learned about you. That that was your start, yeah. That was my start, and it was a great start because that recording is just fabulous all through it, and the the choices of songs that you put on that record are also great. It's a really deep record. My my first record, Jealous of the Moon, had so many different things on it that the, the, the disc jockeys didn't know what to do with it. I mean, there's great slide guitar and solo blues. Uh, there's more produced tracks. Um, Billy Holiday, Van Morrison, um, my own song, which is a pretty fat jazz ballad, Jealous of the Moon. And and they didn't know who, which DJ to give it to, and I was basically an unknown quality. So that record didn't get any airplay at all. It's a really terrific record. It is. It's a great so record. I got, I got pissed and decided, okay, if you want a blues record, I'll give you one. And Terraplane was you know, 16 tracks of, of pretty stark unaccompanied blues and uh, on, on a variety of guitars. And um, I really liked the record and, and it did, you know, help. Um, I also wrote a book on Robert Johnson's music, which was published in 92. Uh, it looks, it looks like this. <laughs> 
Um, and they, it's out of print right now. You can get them on Amazon, but you have to look for that cover because there are a variety of other books out there. Um, and it, it was a landmark production when I when I put it out. So that that gave me the kind of leverage to start to have a you know a career uh, with blues as the as the main focus. Tell me about that book. You you were you wrote the book about the tunings, the the song, the Robert Johnson songs. Yeah. And all the nuances of what Robert Johnson was all about. Tell me how long it took you to write that book and put it all together. The, the book took six years um, to get to get together. And I read absolutely everything I could find on Johnson um, and um, and looked at, you know, listened carefully. And around 1985 or, or four, I kind of figured out what Johnson was doing on the guitar to get that to happen. And that was about 10 years after I first heard it. I just didn't have enough guitar experience to understand what was going on when I first heard that music in the early 1970s. But coming back to it, having spent time with older black players and and seeing how they used their hands and it kind of got a sense of what was going on. By 1986, when I started work on the book, um, I had a very good understanding of what Robert was doing and where and why. And so I started to transcribe the pieces. And um, that took three or four years, uh, 18, 20 hours per song and a lot of painstaking listening without the amazing slowdown or any of the things that are tools are available. Now it was a cassette recorder and a set of earbuds and, you know, go backwards with it in play and start the measure again. And I'm, I listen to that stuff more carefully than anything you can imagine to get the, the transcriptions down. And then I wrote, uh, researched and wrote text uh, on the idioms that Johnson used in his lyrics, uh, black expressions that had fallen out of use in the interim, you know, 30 some years since he died. And um, um, just, you know, chased it down and, and made a pretty fat book. It's a good read whether you play guitar or not, um, but it's also a, a really good reference for where, where Johnson's fingers were and how he did what he did. And there's a co uh, comparable DVD you did with that, right? Yeah, two a couple years after the book, I did a DVD with, uh, uh, and it's now being distributed by Hal Leonard as well on Robert Johnson's guitar techniques, and it's a little more than an hour long walkthrough of the classes of blues that Johnson played. Robert played thirteen tunes in the key of A in standard tuning, and he used all the same figures, chord figures, in those uh, in those songs, and so nearly half of his output is all can all be represented by one tune in the key of A in standard tuning, because you can extrapolate from that to the other techniques that are used. Um, and so I did one in, in, in A in standard tuning, a tune in E in standard tuning, sort of stock um, blues pieces, and then a drop D tune, and then tunes in open tunings and slide. So it's a very representative, wow. very wow. useful uh, lesson. Um, and I, I had a ball doing it. And you can see the younger, cuter Scott Ainsley. You know, that was 1997. That was a long time ago. That's great that you were able to to extrapolate all that stuff and 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 put it on a DVD so people can enjoy it. How do they get it? Can they get it today? Oh yeah, it's it's available through Cattail Music, C A T T A I L music.com, which is you. Which is me. <laughs> and I've been buying up my my books out of print now. Uh, the, the Robert Johnson didn't sell his soul at at the at the crossroads, but he did sell his publishing rights. And the book cost me ten thousand dollars before the first copy was printed, uh, in legal fees and stuff. And uh, it's just a, an amazing what a tangle his publishing life has become. But um, but I do have a few copies of the book here, and I buy them used on Amazon when I can find them at a reasonable price. So I have a few book copies of my own work. <laughs> wow, that <laughs> you have over. to do that. That's incredible that you have yeah, to. Do it's that. just it's just you know again. You know, when you sell your copyright, your copyrights to the devil, this is what happens, you know. <laughs> so, so tell me about some of his contemporaries that were alive. Have, did, they, did you ever get to talk to them, like Honey Boy Edwards and people like that? Yeah, I knew Honey Boy pretty well. Uh, I corresponded with Johnny Shines, uh, and I and also with David uh, Lockwood. Um, Junior Robert, Lockwood. Robert, Robert, Robert Junior. Lockwood, yep. Robert Lockwood Junior. He likes to go by now, but. Yep. Um, and uh, I traveled with him for a couple of days in a van. We were playing gigs around the 60th anniversary of Johnson's death, I think. Anyway, uh, and uh, Honey Boy was, he really earned his nickname. He was a very, very sweet cat and good stories from him. Um, but when I was publishing the book, I 
I wanted to use photographs of each of these men and uh, who had traveled with and known Robert. And in New York State, they have a law that if the person's living, uh, you can't publish their photograph for profit without their permission. So I, I contacted Steve Levere, who managed the, the rights for the Johnson estate at that time. He's now gone and and um, said that I was trying to get in touch with these guys. And he gave me he gave me some contact information for him so I could find them. But he also told me to just go ahead and print them. And if they came to me afterwards, just send them a couple bucks and don't worry about it. And I said, Stephen, I don't roll like that. If these men don't want their photos in the book, they're not going to be in the book. Um, so I wrote each of them a letter and I said, look, I, I haven't got any money to give you, but what I can do is list your festivals, your recordings, and any contact information you'd like to have in the back of the book so that people, you know, you, you will enrich the book and it'll be an advertising tool for you. But that's, you know, I'm broke. That's sort of all I can do. And if you don't want your photos in the book, I won't put them in the book because these guys were used to being ripped off by people like Levere who would, you know, do something. And then if they came after them, uh, say, oh, well, look, send them 50 bucks and, you know, poorly compensate them for the value that they have given us. And I just wasn't going to do that. So I said, if you don't want your photo in the book, I won't put it in the book. You have the complete power to say yes or no to this. These are, this is what I can do and I will do it. Send, you know, let me know. And all of them to a man uh, signed off on having their photos in the book and having a, a guide to festivals that they promoted and, their recordings and stuff like why, that. Why not? Well. Right? Why not? It's, it's well, promotion for them. It is promotion for them, but you have to look at them as victims of the American capitalist system, and in particular, white uh, people who love blues. And uh, being one of those latter category, you know, I, I just wanted to make really clear to them that it was their choice, uh, and that they had the power to say yes or no, and that I would honor that. That's great. And that paid off, um, rather than trying to sneak it by him and then get caught later, which would just make me feel awful in every way. So I wanted to be able to look in the mirror and be happy with me. And so you are. Uh, you, I, am, you were. I am still. <laughs> yeah. I'm, uh, and these guys were all great. Honey Boy was a very, very sweet cat. And uh, and Lockwood was thorny, as you may have heard. I mean, he, was, he, he could be a, a hard personality. But after a couple of days with him in the van, you know, he said, well, if you get to Cleveland, come by. So that was nice. So I, I was digging through your bio, and a, a lot of places within your bio, you talk about Mississippi John Hurt. Tell me about him. I never met Hurt. Um, he was gone before I uh, before I picked up a guitar, even, and I didn't know anybody in my circle who was listening to him. So I didn't run into his music until 1970. I'd been playing guitar for about two and a half years, uh, and. Um, I got to college to Washington Lee University. It was a, a school for Southern gentlemen, which I am not. Um, and I was there on scholarship. So I had the longest year. I was the youngest kid. I got out of high school in three years, went off to college at 17. And uh, and I was a, a real outcast uh, in, in the society of uh, the fraternity boys at Washington and Lee. But there was an older upperclassman there named Plez Geyer, who I think is a practicing psychiatrist now in Massachusetts. But Plez was he'd been in school for a couple of years uh, beyond his his time uh, buying classes and staying out of the Vietnam War, which I applaud. And um, when Plez found out that I was I was new in town and was introduced, he said, you're a guitar player? I said, uh-huh. He said, you need to listen to these two records. Uh, bring them back to me when you can. Now, he he might not know my last name. He certainly didn't know how to track me down. But I was a brother who played guitar, and he trusted me with LPs. That were precious to him. One of them was Mississippi John Hurt Today, which absolutely blew my mind. And the other one was Jesse Winchester's first record that Robbie Robertson produced, which is also an astonishing, life-changing record. Um, and so I spent most of my most of my freshman year trying to figure out how John Hurt did what he did on the guitar, uh, dropping the needle in the track and listening and trying, you know, and figuring out what was going on. And, by Thanksgiving, I could kind of play one or two of those pieces. Um, but I spent the next five years when I picked up a guitar very much working on John Hurt's music. So it was core technique for me. Um, and he was, by all accounts, the very sweetest cat in the world. I mean, nobody has a bad word to say about him up and down in Mississippi, in the communities down there, um, and, and throughout the folk music revival, everybody talks about what a sweet cat this guy was. 
so they in in your in your bio you talk about Piedmont blues, Delta blues, Appalachian music. I mean, you know all you you are a historian of all of that stuff, and you teach. I do teach, and um, it's just a, a misspent youth and then middle age. And if I'm lucky, I'll get to misspend the rest of it and just cash out one of these days. <laughs> Not soon, I hope. I'm counting on another twenty, but um, but the. The beauty of this is learning to learning how as uh, to go ask somebody if you can come see him. Uh, just cold, call him up and say, "Listen, I love your music. I'm trying to learn how to play this stuff. Can I come over?" And the answer has every time I've done that, the answer has been yes. Great, come on. And this works with uh, white Appalachian musicians who were born in the 1880s uh, when I was a kid in the 1970s, uh, and. Um, as well as with older black players born between 1900 and 1930, who I visited up and down North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Virginia to learn something about this music from the people who made it. Now, these weren't famous players. They were neighborhood players. They played on their front porches. They played occasionally for a family party. Um, but they all learned their music, you know, in the, in the first couple decades of the 20th century. When Piedmont blues and ragtime blues were coming into the fore in North Carolina, and I, of course, apprenticed myself to the recordings of the Mississippi Blues guys because I wasn't down there. Um, but I have had a chance to see some of those cats. So um, it's been a really, really wonderful uh, life. And part of it has been on one side of the color line in terms of roots American music, the Southern Appalachian old time banjo and fiddle tradition. I play both those instruments and sing some of that stuff. And and as well as with the, you know, on the other side of the color line with gospel and blues musicians in the Mid-South. So it's been a really, really wonderful life. Now, down in Mississippi, the uh, artists you've, you've been involved with, is it current artists or, or older artists that, that have been around for a while? It's mostly the old guys. Um, I spent a lot of time apprenticed to Johnson's re recording, excuse me, obviously, and a Mississippi John Hurt before that. And then Reverend Gary Davis, but these guys were all gone by the time I, I ran into their music, and they were absolute masters of what they did. And so getting your hand in parallel with theirs, figuring out where they put their fingers and how they use their hands to make that music is like uh, putting on a second skin. It's a, it's a remarkable thing. And between that and working with older musicians, they're, they're now all gone. The guys I work with in North Carolina are all have all passed. Um, but they were very, very fine players. And they brought a piece of the tradition that I couldn't possibly have as a as a white folk sing church singer, and then folk singer, and then you know, a wannabe blues guitar player. Learning how to sing this music is about the trickiest part. There are a lot of good players who can play the guitar parts and get it to happen. But singing and not pretending that you're black, singing in an authentic, one's authentic voice and using the techniques that black singers use to make their lyrics impactful and emotional. Um, those are things that I struggled with for a good long time before I made my first record, which is why I was 40 when I made my first record. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you, you hit it out of the park on, on Terraplane with Death Don't Have Mo No Mercy. That vocal is just wow. Yeah. On it, it's right on. And it's like passionate. And I was like, when I first heard it, I went, wow. Where'd this guy come from? And, <laughs> and how does he, you know, I've heard Re Reverend Gary Davis do it. Yeah. And then I hear you do it. You make it sound more, you made the song sound more new when you, when you put it out. It sounded newer and you were giving it, your whole passion was in that song yeah. that I didn't hear when Gary was originally doing it the same. Well, I was probably 20 years or 30 years younger than Gary was when Gary recorded that for us. You know, I mean, so it's, <laughs> um, at, at 70 uh, something now, I, I'm not sure I could sing the song as I do still sing it, though. I sing it well. But well, the first time I heard it wasn't you it was hot tuna doing it. Oh, sure. And that's completely different. Completely different. Yeah. And yeah. comparing what I remember from hot tuna and then you doing it it was like a whole it was like a breath of fresh air here in that song again no oh, that's cool well that you know this music is it's very much about triggering emotions um and yep. catharsis and and if you want to do that you can't like hide behind the guitar the vocal has to come out and you have to occupy the space 
yeah. um, of the song and let the song occupy you. In some ways, uh, we, we give up control, you know. <laughs> It's yeah. like, like uh, speaking in tongues uh, in, in the in the primitive churches. It's like, yeah, you give yourself over to the heart of the song, and then you and then go there with it. You know, wherever it's going to lead you. It's a, it's fun. Uh, it's immense fun. And you're still you're still having fun doing it. Like I'm having fun doing the radio show after all these years. Yeah, yeah. I've been playing guitar for fifty five, almost fifty six years now, and uh, I play every day, and I play a lot. That's good. And um, I'm often playing something that I can't quite play uh, so that I'm pushing the boundaries of what I know about the instrument. And um, it doesn't all wind up in performance, but it's all really good for me. You know, One of my highlights of listening through your recordings when you sent them to me was the Feral Crow is one of my favorites now. Oh, know. man. That's a dark record. You're a brave man. <laughs> That's that record... About that's what I like is dark, the dark records. Yeah, well, that that record, that was such a big record in terms of production values. I went to Scott Petito over in Woodstock to produce it as a friend, and he and Leslie Leslie sings on it, two great musicians. And and they enrolled Jerry Murata, who played drums for Peter Gabriel for a decade, and all these other, you know, session great, great session players to come in and work. And I really learned how to make a record. Uh, that was produced in that way from Scott and um, spent a lot of money on that record and never saw it because the DJs who play my music uh, thought didn't like that there were drums and bass on the record. So they, they it didn't get any play. I'm thinking about re-recording some of that those songs in acoustic versions, sort of the Scott Ainsley unplugged thing uh, in the next project, just because the songs weren't heard and they're they're really good. Well, they're being heard now because I'm playing some of them. Oh, good that? for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I've, that that kind of um, I do both. I do both the acoustic. I'll I'll put in acoustic stuff and I do the electric stuff like that with drums and everything. Yeah, and that one was interesting because it did have you know most of what you did prior to that was was all mostly acoustic, and that right. one wasn't. Right. Well, I was playing acoustic guitar, but Lord have mercy. <laughs> right. Mark Schulman's guitar playing on that record is absolutely transcendent, and I. Uh, I I remember sitting in the studio in the in in, in the in the uh, on the on the side of the glass with the not where the mics were but with, where the gear is with the recording engineer listening to them track that record and when Jerry Murata started drumming on one of those songs tears just leapt out of my eyes because he wasn't playing the chart he was playing the lyrics he was playing the drama of the song on drums I mean I don't know how he did it yeah but he was following the arc of the drama in the song. Um, rather than just like, okay, there's four beats here and there's four beats there, and then we go and do this. It's like, no, he was he was listening to the words and killing it. And I still, when I hear that, I hear that record, I'm still just shocked at the talent and the beauty of the playing on those on those tracks. It's really really something. The last record, the the last shot got him. Tell me about that. <laughs> well, I I was in Louisiana uh, visiting friends. Uh, uh, maybe 10 years ago, and uh, a woman was playing this little uh, 1934 L50 Gibson arch top guitar with big round sound hole, and I've got it here. I thought you might want to see it. Um, sure. And, um, you know, it's just a beautiful little arch top guitar, and I, I, I went up to her after she played it, and I said, you know, can I see that for a second? And she said, sure. And I, I put on my finger picks as I'm doing now. And, um, and I played a little bit of the beginning of the first track Robert Johnson recorded, The Kind Hearted Woman. And it sounded more like Robert Johnson's recording than any other instrument I ever played. I mean, I knew these guitar parts cold. I played them on hundreds of guitars. And this guitar was like 1934. Gibson. The right voice. It's a little Gibson. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so I thought, well, this is, this is pretty special. And Linda said, Linda Halton, or, uh, no, Linda, uh, I can't remember Linda's last name. God, Linda, forgive me. I'm old. Anyway, she, she's, she said, I, I brought it out here because I'm thinking about selling it. 
And without looking up, you know, I, I, I said, well, what would you want for it? She says, I don't know, a thousand bucks. I said, I'll take it. And she went, oh, because she wasn't really sure she wanted it. She was thinking about selling it, but she didn't realize that she just sold it. Um, and so we spent the day, I was trying to figure out how to get two guitars home on the plane without one of them getting wrecked. And, um, and I was also, you know, figuring out how to get her the money. And, you know, I was work working that end of the deal, you know, and she was walking around talking to her boyfriend saying, you know, I'm not sure I want to, I, 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 I don't think I want to. And he was saying, look, it's Scott. We know him. It's like having the guitar in the family. You never play it. You should sell it. And so she, she puzzled over it for a long time. And at the end, I just said, look, if you don't want to sell this guitar to me, when it became clear to me, she was hesitant. I said, uh, I won't take it from you. I mean, I just, but if you do decide to sell it, I'd like you to give me a call and we and, and have it be something like the price we talked about today, even if it's two years from now, just, you know, like, and, uh, so she, she reconsidered it. She kept the guitar and I didn't bring it home. And two weeks later, I sent her an email and said, have you thought any more about that? And I got, well, I'm still thinking about it. And a month later, I sent her another one and two months later, another, and, you know, now I'm four months away from having a guitar in my hands. I figured, you know, she didn't want to sell this. So it's okay. And I just let it go. And two years later, I found myself, <laughs> you know, as, as one does in the middle of the night, looking longingly at small bodied Gibson, you know, vintage Gibsons on e with my credit card out. I'm going like, stop, you know, where one of these things is. Yeah. Try to go get it again. Right. <laughs> so I, I sent her another note and I said, look, if, if you've thought about this, you know, I, I'm, I'm still interested in that guitar. And she's, she wrote back immediately. She said, you know, I walked by the closet that that guitar has been in since you wanted it. It hasn't been out of the closet. It hasn't been out of the case. Two years. And she said, this is stupid. I should sell this to Scott. It still took six months. I mean, it's just, this is a hard guitar to let go of because you're not going to get another. Right. You know, um, and and so I, I got the guitar. And when it arrived, it had a particular voice, you know, that that is, uh, it's, it's good for certain things and very good for certain things. So I decided to let the guitar choose the songs for the record. So it's the only record I've ever made that is focused around one instrument and not the songs. Wow. And uh, this little Gibson is it. And I call it the last shot got him for a John Hurt tune that I play. This plays John Hurt great. And uh, um, the, the name of the tune is actually the first shot missed him. But the second line is, but the last shot got him, you know, and the last shot got him is a better title for a CD. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I used it. Um, so 1934 Gibson. Was that some? Was that a, a a guitar that Robert would have used while he was alive, or no? He the the most famous guitar that he played was a Kalamazoo, which was a small bodied black faced flat flat top guitar, um, and it you know it's this this is this has the same kind of voice as that Gibson that that Kalamazoo did, and um, Kalamazoo, Michigan was where Gibson was. So I, the Kalamazoo guitars may have been made by Gibson flunkies or, or, or by, as a kind of an off brand for them. I don't know the, the details that somebody will call in and correct us both. I'm sure. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's the, it's the sound. Um, and That's it's got right, a big sound by the way. With the right, the right it's, vintage. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so uh, on that record, you hear very exposed guitar parts again um, with this, this particular instrument. And it's a it's a real joy to to hear it sing. Um, after I made the record, the, the guitar was in fairly fragile shape when I got it, and I had to have a lot of work done on it if I was going to take it out of the road and play it. It had to be more stable and and dependable. So I, I put a lot of money into fixing it up. The guitar is now ready to go another eighty years. It's better than it. it it's in better shape now and sounds better probably than it ever did. Looks almost um, brand new when you see it. When I saw yeah, it's, it, it's 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 a very pretty it's a very pretty thing, and um, it didn't have a t it didn't have a pick guard on it. So this is Koa. I made a pick guard for it uh, so that I wouldn't scratch up the front any more than it had been scratched up. And it's you know it's 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 a pretty thing. It, it it's a it'll dress a man up. You know. <laughs> well, let's talk about you have a website and there's yeah. a. This thing on the website called Patreon. You want to talk about that a little bit? I was fascinated by that, by the way. Yeah, I've, I've been resisting Patreon. It's called Patreon, Patreon. like, patron, like yeah. patrons. Uh, I've been resisting it for five or six years, but the pandemic 
push me into it. Um, the marketing for Patreon, the idea is that that people who support your work can tithe a little bit, you know, subscribe with a small monthly payment or payment of the size they would like to make. And they get access to an archive of essentially private posts and, and songs and things like that. Well, during the pandemic, when I finally went back to look at it, because I had to do something, all the marketing for Patreon is if you give, if, you, if people give you five bucks, you give them this. If they give you 10 bucks, oh, then you give them this. If they give you 25 bucks, then you give them the good stuff. And the very last thing I want is to exclude the guy who can't afford 25 bucks from the cool stuff. I, I don't want to sell the good stuff to rich people. I want the good stuff to be available for everybody. So during the pandemic, in frustration and also needing to replace the touring income, I finally dove deeper into Patreon and realized that I could assign privileges, I could assign access to different levels of posts, to different levels of tithing. So um, I decided that everybody gets access to everything, regardless of how much money they give me. And it's just a flat, once you're in, it's a flat society. Everybody gets everything. And the only reason to pay more than five bucks a month, which is a minimum, is to buy a place at the table for the guy who can't afford more than five bucks. That's and about, that's about, great. about half of the guys, uh, uh, you know, I have like 115 or 20 people on Patreon. It floats a little bit. People come and go. But um, about half of them pay more than the minimum. And the only reason they do it, they don't get anything special for that. They only do it to support the community and to support the work that I'm doing and, and, and allow me to continue to do it. And I take that as a real, the beginning of a gift economy. I mean, that's just a remarkable thing. So I work hard for those guys. And there's stuff on Clawhammer banjo up there. There's a lot of blues stuff, fancy guitar, instrumental arrangements with tablature and lessons on the ergonomics of playing guitar and, and posts on blues history. And it's just, a, it's a mishmash of stuff. But I, I work hard for those guys and it helps sustain me. I'm not making a killing. But I don't need to make a killing. I just need enough. I, I want to mention to you, I was I was reading through your, going through your website and looking at your um, booking terms on the website. I was laughing. I'm going, wow, a musician who actually tells them what he wants. It's pretty cool. <laughs> well, we've, we've, we've all been burned in certain ways. And, you know, the writers on contracts get longer and longer. And what happens is, Every musician adds what the last boneheaded promoter did to them, so that <laughs> oh, and, oh, and you, oh, and, oh, and you can't do this, and you can't do this. I have a friend who's a, a performance poet, Glennis Redmond. She's a very, very fine writer, and we used to perform together a lot, uh, you know, fifteen <clears throat> years ago. Um, with her doing performance poems uh, on Black history and her personal history as a black woman from South Carolina, and me playing music cheek by jowl. So she'd do a piece and I'd do a piece. She'd do a piece and I'd do a piece. And we, did, we barely scripted it. There were a couple of things that we knew we were going to do together, but there was always a new poem. And I always had to follow Janet Glennis onto the stage going like, well, what am I going to play after that? You know, it was a real conversation between music and poetry. Um, and Glennis uh, was one, her, her, her contract now says that Glennis will not perform poetry in the high school's hallways while students are changing classes because somebody thought that was a good idea and did it to her. <laughs> so, <laughs> nope, we're not doing that, you know. Mine, mine says that you, you, all the video games in the room that I'm working in and within hearing have to be unplugged. <laughs> wow. That was 20 years ago we needed to add that. <laughs> well, when I went on the let, when I went on to <laughs> your site and I saw the the booking terms, I it, it made me think of Chuck Berry and, and him telling the promoters, I want cash up front or I'm not playing. Basically. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> basically. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, m most most of the blues uh, performers travel with handguns and enforce the terms of their contract at the gig. Yeah. Um, and um, it's amazing how money will show up when somebody pulls a handgun out of their purse and says, no, we, we agreed on this. And you're not going to underpay me now saying there weren't that many people who came through the door. You're going to pay me what you owe me. It's going to be cash right now. Yep. Um, and before the gig, that's that's another matter. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah, he wouldn't play. He, he wanted the cash up front before he even made one, played one note. He wanted his money right there. Yeah, well, um, and there's, you know, that tells you what happened to him to make that 
Yeah. <laughs> they got burnt. You said it earlier. They, yeah. You know, all those musicians got burnt and yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And you have compassion for them yeah. and, and understand where that comes from. It's like, okay, good. We'll take care of you. And it's a way of proving that one is honest. Yeah. Um, right out of the box, which is, yes, we said this and here it is. And if we make more than you get, you, you know, if we get a big, big house, then we'll give you a percentage of the door. And that's, you know, that's the way this, this business runs when it runs well. Tell <laughs> me, tell rare. me a story, an important story in your life from one of the older blues men that you, you've come in contact with that you learned from something that you learned from them. Oh man. Good question. Isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, one of the oldest guys I knew, I met uh, in 1988. His name was Willie Malloy, and Willie, uh, W I L L I E, not that you'll find his name anywhere. He was completely unknown. But he rented a house from a, a professor at a college where I was the artist in residence. And I did my initial concert to introduce myself to the faculty. And this guy came up to me afterwards and said, There's a guy renting one of my houses across town who I think you'd like to meet. And I said, Well, who is he? And he says, Well, his name's Willie Malloy, and he plays guitar, and he was born in 1900 which makes him 88 years old now. And I said, you're right, I want to meet him. When do, and so after class on Tuesday, the next Tuesday morning, uh, John picked me up and we, we went over to, to visit Willie. And Willie was blind, he's been blinded in an explosion when he was a kid. And he still played uh, electric guitar with the quartet for his church. They'd come and collect him and carry him off. And Willie was um, the most astonishing human being, uh, as many of these guys were, but Willie, I, I spent a lot of time with him. I was working in the town he lived in, and we I visited with him every couple of weeks for, for a year and a half, and then went to see him afterwards. I, the last time I went by Willie's house was in 1992, and Willie was gone. You know, I mean, the house was boarded up, and but um, he was a really, really fine human being and played everything in drop D tuning. And he taught me to play uh, I Will Trust in the Lord is one of the tunes I learned from Willie. And it's a it's a standard kind of gospel tune with some very strange guitar things in it uh, that he played. Uh, and uh, in terms of pitches and, and chord choices. But mainly what I learned from Willie was, was uh, you know, to be really kind. Um, and that when people do you wrong, probably they don't understand. You know, there's very little evil in the world. And there's a lot of stupidity. And, and a lot of bad things happen because people aren't paying attention. Um, but it doesn't necessarily make them bad people. It just I means it was kind of a bad choice and it's going to cost you. But if they knew, and John Jackson said this too, if they knew how much trouble this made for us, they wouldn't have done that. They just didn't know. Man, you learned a lot from those guys. You know, I'm, I am not the boy I was born to be. <laughs> and these men and women change me. I mean, they are, when I play now, there are six or seven black grandmothers and grandfathers in the wings looking out on across the stage going, like, don't screw this up. <laughs> <laughs> and swing for the fences. You know, me, if you're going to, if you're going to play, go play. Let me ask you about someone else that I, in all these interviews I've done, his name keeps coming up because he was local. He lived local here in New York. Mm -hmm. Sun House. Did you ever oh, have any? Yeah. I was born in, in, in Rochester, which is where they found Sun. Um, and I never crossed paths with him, but I spent I, many, many good stories. And I know people who did. Uh, and he was a guy who bounced back and forth, you know, between the juke joints and the church. He was a real preacher. And when he got sick of the hypocrisy in the church, he'd go back into the joints. And we got sick of the nonsense in the joints and the violence and stuff. Then he'd go back in the in the church. He just did it his whole life. But man, when that man sings, no holds barred. I mean, absolutely astonishing. And I wish I had, I wish I had seen him. Uh, he was a force like Muddy Waters. You just, you wouldn't want to follow that guy onto a stage. You know, he was really um, larger than life in every way. A wonderful, yeah. wonderful cat. You want to talk about your website so people can find out about everything that's uh, about Scott Ainsley? Yeah, there's uh, there are two sites. The one is the is the cattail music, uh, cattail like the plant, c a t t a i l music dot com, and that's got all the tracks I've ever recorded, uh, full lyrics, historical notes. Um, you know, it's really deep. It's a deep and complex site. I'm responsible for the content, but my wife did the web design. And it's truly beautiful. It is um, nice. And 
And the other one is the Patreon site, which is some of the posts are open to the public and co kind of peruse what's there. And that's uh, HTTP, of course, Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com, Patreon, like patron, but Patreon dot com slash Scott, S-C-O-T-T, Ainsley, A-I-N-S-L-I-E. And uh, again, for five bucks, you get access to 230 or 40 posts now. And there's stuff on cooking there, uh, the, the, my passions. Uh, and I started writing a kind of a memoir in installments, which is also turning up there first. So That's great. I just want to say thank you for taking some time out of your busy day and busy life doing, you know, musician, teacher, you name it. You've got it all covered, all the bases covered. Well, the the, inform, you know, the information that was shared with me, the friendships that I built with these older black players and the piece of their lives that they shared with me, you know, I am now the custodian for that stuff. And it doesn't do me any good to die with it in my pocket. None at all. Um, and it'd be a real dead end and a, and a shame to do it. So I do a lot of teaching on Skype and, and uh, some Zoom lessons with people who prefer that platform. And I teach at some of the guitar camps, the Swannanoa Gathering down in Western North Carolina. I've been there most of the last 30 years as a legacy instructor there, teaching blues and slide guitar and now vocals as well. So um, it's been a, been a great thing to have the privilege of sitting with these men and women. And now they're gone. And if you're going to get a piece of that, it's going to be from one of us who spent time with them, not just listening to the records, but actually time on the ground. Uh, watching their hands and learning from them and, and playing music with them. And that's that's the only thing that really makes me different. And the only credit I can take for that is that when I found myself in front of those people, I knew how valuable that moment was. I was not interested in anything but getting as much as I could of what they had to give with no no rules, no ego, no nothing. Just like this is critically important and some things went by me, I'm sure, but I paid very, very close attention when I was with them, and it's changed who I am. I'm a real believer in apprenticeship, John, and, and I think that that you should allow the music to change you before you change it. Um, and that requires, you know, really being vulnerable to the tradition and, and, as I say, apprenticing oneself to what has gone before. But then when you go out on stage, it has to be your hands. It has to be your mouth. It has to be your time. And yeah. so you have to, we have to adjust these things so that, but when you make those changes, I think it's incumbent on you to know what happened before and how to do it. Um, because otherwise you may just be watering down the tradition rather than strengthening it. Well, I want to say thank you very much for taking the time out today and uh, look forward to someday having you come into my studio and play. Oh, I'd love to do that. We just had to figure out the routing and get me down there. We're not that yeah. far apart. Yeah. I'd love to come down, John. And I, there's nothing like live radio. I mean, it's just the best. So I'll bring a bunch of instruments and we'll come down. We'll set that up. Yeah, I got, I got, um, just so you don't, you don't know this, but the University of Mass at Lowell has a sound recording major and I have the sound recording techs in make doing the live sound. So It'll be great. The sound oh, will be great. Well, we will. Uh, we will. We'll, we'll have to look forward into the early or in the new year to uh, when things quiet down a little bit and the world starts to slow down in the middle middle of winter up here. And uh, uh, we'll scoot down there and have some fun. I'd love that. I I would absolutely keep in contact with me, and I want to make that happen. Yeah. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure right. to be with you and your listeners. Same here. Thank all you. The, all the best. All right. We'll see you. Thank you. <laughs>